Waking up in this dark little room Underneath the stairs Never knowing if I'll be alive To see the sunlight I take it all in I'm breathing it out I still feel the same There's nothing to do except To try my life in fear to know what is the right direction the lights in the city are burned out another lost opportunity with each reflection
songs I really was uh, focused primarily on getting kind of a, a piano feel to it. Um, I was surrounded by a lot of people that were doing, you know, guitar and I really wanted to kind of be against the grain and kind of against the mold of what I was seeing around me and uh, particularly really influenced by, you know, Ben Folds and Regina Spector's Us was kind of a really big influence on making, you know, in my mind to start music kind of in this more eerie type of way to kind of hear this classical type music that was still in a modernized you know environment um, and really spoke wonders to me really told the story um, so you know I've had you know Dark Little Room written for so many years and it took me about three or four years just to kind of get it off the ground um, and as time's gone on it's developed and you know people have always asked what the song is about I always kind of envisioned um, you know kind of you know trying to make a a fictional story because I was so afraid to talk about my own anxiety, my own depression until years later when I started dealing with that myself and kind of admitting that to myself and, and seeking the help I needed, the song came a lot more to light and when I reproduced it and I, I put it out there for the world to see, like it was definitely something that uh, I was really happy with, you know, being transparent with the audience and a lot of people sing along to it, a lot of people really like it, so it's it's been nice to, you know, have a song like that in my uh, discography. Um, Space Dust. Space Dust. You can start off this one since you. Okay. Okay. So I've been working. We had been working on uh, Freddie's EP, and we were trying to figure out what the fourth song was going to be. I had a ballad in mind. Like yeah. It's really '90s as ballad with a key change. Which it was. I think it would have been fun, but I feel like I <laughs> yeah. feel like the content of the the that, EP, yeah. the feel that we were going for, um, it didn't quite fit with the other three. And I had this song I had written eight years previous that had never been released. Uh, that I still had like a demo from when I first started messing around with le electronic music and whatnot, and the big ninja sounds. Uh, most of the production, I mean, I redid all the production from scratch. It ended up being. Uh, pretty well the same thing. I even like used samples out of the original production and then updated like drum sounds and added some new flavor to it. But, uh, but overall, it, it, it's the same thing with his verses on it and, and the hook that I had written. Uh, and uh, I, it, it's, it's really interesting when you allow, once you write something, you write something about a particular thing. And if you can let go of that, what the song can breathe as its own life, uh, as other people bring their perspectives to it and whatnot, it's a pretty amazing thing. Uh, and to see how it has turned out, it really it's it's like the song was waiting eight years for 
Freddie and I to get yeah. together and do it. So I, and I think our visions are kind of similar. I mean, he said, you know, when he wrote it, it was in the in the it was I believe in the eyes of the child, right? I believe it was like it was. I was I was speaking. To, I was actually speaking to my unborn son. Yeah. Uh, at the time, we just found out that that uh, my wife was pregnant, and so I wanted to I wanted to say all the things that I, I wanted to say to him, like yeah. that was, seemed very important at the time. And for me, it was kind of like when I heard the song and I, I, I kind of heard the music, it was kind of more this reminiscent type feeling of like kind of back in that innocence and youth. And I think the song has so much simplicity, um, but it says, I think, so much with so little. Um, and I think that was what really got, got us to vibe on this song was that uh, our vision, even though there are very two different contexts and two different perspectives and experiences, uh, I think that's what really where the magic really happened. Absolutely, so. absolutely, I agree.
when I moved out here uh, in 2018, um, I kind of was going through some, you know, rough spots, you know, I was getting a lot of takeout sushi, which doesn't really change, I just work out now. But I was in a depressive state, uh, I was away from home, about 16 hours away. Um, and then kind of when I revert to kind of to some of those those moods as I go to different types of music, um, and I kind of retreated back into the uh, the shoegazing uh, music and ambient music, which was a slow dive. And I was a really big fan of slow dive. I first found them back when I was about 22, when I was like, I, and I heard their their album that came out only like, at that point it was like 24 years or 25 years before that. Um, and uh, it really resonated with me. And then, um, you know, as time went on, I got better. I got out of that mood. And then when I moved back out here, I found out they released an album literally 27 years later. And uh, it was uh, Sugar uh, Sugar for the Pill. And it was off that uh, that album, which was, uh, you know, from 2015. And I really kind of wanted to go that route a little bit. And when I wrote Jenny, um, I was trying to think about these relationships I had in my life that I never really uh, kind of, you know, uh, kind of looked back on and it really kind of go in, how did this really affect me? Because I kind of moved on from it pretty quick because I was someone that was like, I don't really want to really dwell on this. Um, and I thought, you know, hearing the way that Slow Dive was able to kind of still keep their shoegazing thing where it was so, again, it had these just like very small little slivers of sound but again the way that he sang it in this high-pitched voice it just was like wow it just opened up so many different doors and when I brought Jenny to Steven um, he took a very different approach and I found that there's a little bit more of, of, of fun in the kind of darkness of the story um, and so like you know I think when we did it together it was it was it was probably the quickest one we did it was a very quick process for that song yeah, I mean, I remember. I remember as soon as he played it, I immediately heard the arrangement in my head. As like, I know what we're doing with this. This is. It was the. It was the only one. It was like that. It was like, there's no doubt in my mind what direction we're doing and how this is gonna sound. So. And what was nice about that was that it just, even though my original vision was to be more simple, I found that we were still able to kind of hone into those vocals that I really was really like really prominent on getting, because um, I think that's what stands out the most really track is, is the vocals I for think sure the story of vocals really um and it kind of makes light of a a relatively dark time well, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Someone you did.
Watching. Uh, if you would like to see more, uh, you can log on to freddyborn.com. Uh, my EP, The Trouble Boy, The Bonfire Disco, produced by this gentleman to my right, your left, um, was out in April, um, but it is still streaming on all those major platforms. And uh, Steven, I think, has some music out as well. I do. Uh, you, can, you can find stuff that I do at Big Ninja Delight, and that's any anywhere you're looking for music. And uh, I'm going to be releasing a bunch of new stuff in the next few months. It's, we're wrapping that up right now, so. Yeah. yeah. And then last but not least, but make sure that you only listen to the stuff that was released in 2018 and up, because everything after, before that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Freddie Born. Hey, I'm Stephen Horning. And this is Pocket City Songs. Yeah. Um, so Stephen and I don't take ourselves too seriously uh, as people. I would say we take ourselves seriously as musicians. Um, so with that, we will start off this whole thing with a, a false narrative. Um, so follow along if you can. So. Yeah, it defeats the purpose if you tell the, the false narrative. Well, I just don't want people, because I know my dad's going to watch this, and he's going to be like, what are you talking about? So, anyway, see, the dog's okay with it. Yeah, that's okay. So back in, it was in 1967 or 68? Well, right? we originally met each other in 66, but we, yeah. just, we didn't start playing music until 68. Okay, so it was around 1968, we were on tour, we were just kind of opening up for the Beach Boys, we were out in the Netherlands, um, we were a cover band though, we weren't really, we were just kind of like hyping up the crowd as best we could, we were like, what was the hybrid, it was like, I remember we did some Leonard Skinner and then we, uh, Nirvana and Nelly Furtado, right, where those are the three, like the whole premise demographic that we were trying to get. Well, I mean, people really, really like Candle on the Wind, and, yeah. and I gotta say, like, there was a thing that happened where, well, we're not gonna get all that. Really. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, this, the this song was inspired by Richard Marks and, and Elton John, and, you know, we were trying really hard to do our own original music, and, you know, no one wanted to hear it, and, um, you know, uh, Beach Boys are like, hey, like, we would love to hear some of your material, and... I was like kind of really against it, and Steven at that point, he went into a stupor of just not talking to people. It was um, a dark time for it me. It was dark, yeah. It was a dark time for me. But I was like, you know, rehearsing, and uh, I was just kind of having that little, the sound, do, 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 the little triple, do, do, and, and like Lenny Kravitz showed up, and he was like, he was like, man, that is, that's, that's it. And I was like, I was like, I know Len, but like, you know, I don't think anyone wants to hear that. And he goes, it doesn't matter about what the people want to hear, it's about what your heart wants to feel. And I was like, 
Uh, yeah, Leonard, I get that. Did you, you say know? it in that weird accent? I think. I, I, You know, it's been such a long time. I don't remember how he really talks. And then, you know, I really wanted it to be this ballad song, you know, just kind of really focus on the vocals and the piano. And then I remember it was Tito Puente. He showed up, right? He, he was like, he was like, he was like, you know. That dude knew how to party. He, yeah, but he was like Necesito Tambores, and I was like, you know, no, no Lucero, you know. I was like, no, like Tito, just because you're like legend of percussion doesn't mean that every song needs it. But uh, you know, we were convinced, and it did well, but never got signed. And then, what was it? Fifteen years later, we find out John Stamos used the song to audition for Jesse Kostopoulos' role in Full House, and I mean, the rest but, is history, really. Yeah, yeah which is yeah. yeah with no offense, though, like John, I hope you're doing well, which you are. But I mean, never got an invite on the show. Beach Boys on the show multiple times. Well, he doesn't. He doesn't send you free yogurt. I don't think so. So, uh, you know, you're welcome, John. That was great. Yeah, that was good. That's, good. That's a wrap. That's it. Good stuff. Right, guys. Nice. All right. <laughs> it's like, we're not going to use any of that. Now play the song. Like, <laughs> all right. I was like, wow, really? They guys went this far? No. Okay. I was hoping people find it funny. <laughs> or will they just be like, Ugh. I don't know. That's it's it. an arts audience, you know, they'll get it. They'll All get right. it.